I'm joined today by Mr. Ali Nurani, who is a consultant orthopedic and trauma surgeon. He's the medical director of a group called Orthopedic Specialists, whose main clinic is in Harley Street, London. And he's also a specialist in regenerative medicine. Ali, great to have you join us. Thank you for coming along. Stephen, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to attend this lunchtime meeting. Um, um, and again, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I am, as you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I specialize in mostly in shoulders and elbows. And, and today we've been talking about ACJ instability and it's one of my favorite topics. So I'm looking forward to catching up. Just a, just a quick one. I'm, I have not come across um, your organization, orthopedic specialists before. Um, how does the group work? Are you a, a varied and uh, multidisciplinary organization? That's right. So, so the concept of orthopedic specialists has been around for uh, when I was a registrar. Um, so it's been something that's been building up to it. The group's been around for three or four years. We have now 20 consultants that work with us. Most of us work in central London with some of them practicing in the periphery of London. So they tend to come in and out. We actually have quite a few Europeans in our group as well, right? So like the number one elbow surgeon in the world, Roger Van Riet, they're right, based in Belgium, um, is part of the group, you know, Christian Clay, um, Ronald Van Haven, two big osteotomy guys from the knee world, um, based in, um, um, in Germany. Uh, they are part of the group as well. So the ethos of the group is very simple, right? We've gone out and said, grow slow, grow organically, but really get the best of the orthopedic community out there to work together. Um, so um, all the surgeons tend to be uh, smart people. They tend to be cutting edge as far as surgery is concerned, but also ahead of you know other stuff like biologics and rehab, etc., so that we can offer the patients um, the best treatment. So that's the basis of the orthopedic group. Uh, um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really fun um, being the medical director of a bunch of orthopedic surgeons that are regarded as uh, some of the top in the world. Yeah, I noticed actually when I was reading up on you um, earlier on that uh, obviously you've got an interest in regenerative medicine, but actually this is because you we were trying to get away from surgery itself. Do you want to, before we talk about the ACJ, would you want to tell us a little bit about regenerative medicine? Yes, of course. I mean, um, so for um, those um, in the audience that don't know this, that I, I'm also a member and on the education committee for a group called USER, which is a European shoulder of uh, European Society of Shoulder and Elbow Rehab. Um, so I've been very, very, um, you know, rehab orientated in my practice throughout. Right. So ethos is most people don't need surgery; they need good rehab. Some people need surgery, but they still need good rehab afterwards, right? Um, but like most surgeons, um, it's very difficult to talk about myself, but it's easier to talk about somebody like a, a knee specialist, for example. Um, so we have quite a few knee specialists that are regarded as some being some of the top in the world. And we, they are moving away like I am doing from shoulder replacements. They're moving away from knee replacements. And why is that? Is they figured out that actually the concept of joint preservation is where we should be heading out. And in joint preservations, there are surgeries that can help you. There are braces that can help and rehab can help. Uh, but there's also a role for biologics, which include BRP, bone marrow, fat-based, nanofat stuff. So we became interested in that about four or five years ago. And um, because we, each of us had a big cohort of patients who were young, uh, with arthritic shoulders in my practice that I knew just shoulder replacement would not be a good option for them. And traditionally, you just can't do anything for them, but you start looking at, you know, treatment options for them. And there were some interesting surgical options, but what was really interesting was that even better non-surgical options. Um, so we formed a separate entity um, called the Regenerative Clinic, uh, which um, offers patients... Uh, these alternate treatments. But the concept is very interesting. So as a group, we have a very um, wide approach to everything. So we don't focus that everybody needs surgery or every needs rehab. You, know, you have to look at the patient for who they are, figure out what they need, right? Sometimes they do need surgery. Sometimes they definitely don't need surgery. So if you're not blinded by the approach and you have a wide approach 
that can offer patient anything from rehab to surgery to biologics to a combination approach, I think it will do best for our patients. Um, so that's where the regenerative clinic concept uh, came about, and it does it does really well for the patients. Yeah, I guess uh, thinking back a few years, and I, has, I emphasize this is not my opinion, but to such that other doctors would have said that very often if you went to see a, a shoulder specialist, the only thing he would consider would be shoulder replacement or whatever, because that was where, that was how he earned his money. That's what he did. And it's nice to hear that you know you're not alone. There are lots and lots of people we've interviewed who are saying, well, actually, we've got to take a wider approach to this. And uh, I guess also it's probably very uh, helpful for your insurance if you do fewer surgeries because there are fewer adverse outcomes that can occur. That's right. I mean, the to be honest, the uh, malpractice insurance don't really care that much, and the the insurance companies don't care that much. Uh, what the insurance company like is you know, you make a decision, you fix it, and you let the patient go, um, which is a bit difficult concept. Sometimes what you need to do is not uh, fix a patient and do an operation, but maybe see them a bit more often to make sure mm -hmm. that they're getting the right milestones. And that concept becomes really difficult for the insurance company. Although it's cheaper for them, um, they do like their system to say, here's a problem, fix it, discharge it, please, right? Um, and that's not what fits uh, most people. Um, a lot of my practice is also tertiary referral. So half my NHS and about 20, 30% of my private practice will be tertiary practice. And by definition, that already becomes a little bit more complicated because somebody already has had a go in some ways. Um, so, so, so I think overall, you know, the, the, the idea is that, um, you know, every patient is really different uh, and, and, you know, you see some and you tell them you don't need surgery, but others you meet them and you kind of say, well, you need to fix that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's getting the right decisions, what I think makes us as good surgeons and certainly us in our group and, so, and myself, you know, you know, surgery, I, I wouldn't say surgery is the last option, but I want to say is surgery is the correct option for some people Whereas the majority of the patient don't need it. So let's uh, let's get into the meat of this. Let's talk about ACJ instability. Um, you said that's a particular interest of yours. How did that happen? Well, you know, it's part of the shoulder, as you know. So, so as a shoulder and elbow surgeon, that's definitely an interest. Uh, but uh, living in London is quite interesting. So London has a lot of um, cyclists, right? Um, also has a lot of people that do a lot of sports, especially weekend warriors and so on, a lot of rugby. So you end up seeing ACJ injuries quite a lot, right? So there are a lot of people that cycle, cycle and they fall off their bikes. And if you are on a cycle and if you're a reasonably good cyclist, you'll hold on to the handlebars and you end up falling on your right on your tip of your shoulders. So you either um, break your collarbone, i.e. have a clavicle fracture, um, or you have an ACJ injury. Um, mm -hmm. so, so as 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 a shoulder surgeon in London, the practice of seeing ACJ injuries is big, right? So see, I see a lot of ACJ injuries. Um, and and what I was noticing was that, that uh, there are lots of different opinions on how to treat ACJ injuries. Um, and when there are 100 different operations to fix it and 100 different opinions whether to fix it or not fix it, um, it was, it suddenly became very interesting because I knew that people hadn't really figured out how to treat ACJs. And then you have to start looking back into why that is a problem. Um, and it was obvious. The problem starts off with, you know, the basics how people um, don't diagnose it correctly. Um, the, the, um, our classification, in my opinion, is incorrect. So it's not prognostic on how to treat it. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly the ways of fixing it um, is all over the place. And so I spent a lot of my early career figuring out what works in ACJ, what does work, thinking in from a logical point of view, you know, what are the forces across it, what are the biomechanics around it, how do we need to make somebody better? And, and, and then apply those in, in my patients uh, with the evidence, and then you figure out actually you can get really good results in almost all your patients if you apply common sense backed by good research. 
Um, and that's what we've done really. Um, so it's become my interest and interest and people find me because um, if they have ACG instability and therefore I tend to see a lot of patients that have ACG problems that have gone wrong um, because they know that um, I, can, I can hopefully sort it out for them. Can we talk etiology for a minute? You've mentioned a number of sort of traumatic uh, possibilities there. Are there non-traumatic uh, causes in your experience? Yes, actually, what's, what's really interesting is that, um, you know, there is that obvious trauma, as you know, somebody said, I hit myself and bang, here's my ACJ up in the air, right? Um, but there are the atraumatic versions as well. Um, you know, you should be a little careful whether there is true atraumatic, i.e. no trauma at all, or there has been subtle minor trauma, or there has been repeated overuse. So there is some element of traumatic elements. But we tend to see patients um, rarely, thank God, but there are patients who have collagen disorders, who have gen generalized laxity that also get ACJ problems, right? In fact, you know, I think personally that even in patients who have ACJ pain, right, without any trauma, um, is usually due to some kind of micro instability um, because most people know that ACJ arthritis is part of growing up, right? Uh, by the time you have gray hair, most people have ACJ arthritis. And why is that? Because, you know, the, the joint is the size of your nail on your thumb, right? It's tiny. Um, and throughout your life, you know, the collarbone is the only bone that connects your shoulder uh, to the rest of your body. So throughout your life, you have this tiny joint that is taking all the forces from your arm and transmitting to your body. And with time, the joint wears out. So if you see most 40 year olds, especially people that have, you know, done sports and activity in their life, they will have imaging to show that they have ACT arthritis. But that is not symptomatic arthritis. That is just normal part of growing up, basically, as I say, it's normal age-related changes, and they're normal. So they don't hurt, they don't have instability, but you see some people that have normal-looking ACJs and they have pain. Of course, you'll see some people that have some arthritic changes that have pain as well. And invariably, if you look deep inside, it is not the arthritis, perhaps, that causes the pain, but it is that movement in the joint that aggravates the inflammation, right? So if you can have a joint, ACJ, that is stiff as anything, of course it won't hurt because it's not moving. Um, whereas if you have something that is moving a little bit and then rubs, then that causes pain. So you do have atraumatic causes of ACJ pain that I personally think is due to instability as well. Yeah. I was just thinking whether particular sports might be vulnerable to it through overuse. And I know... You know, it's not a joint that one normally thinks of as being subject to overuse, but perhaps rowers or gymnasts, do they, um, do they have particular problems? So I tend to, the core that I tend to see quite a bit um, is actually uh, weightlifters, right? So, uh -huh. so professional weightlifters tend to have a lot of ACG changes. Um, they tend to have, um, uh, occasionally they get a condition called osteolysis, Right, so it's not just arthritis, but the end of the clavicle basically starts breaking down because of the overpressure. You know, every joint, like every ligament, goes through a process of remodeling. We're always breaking and rehealing. And when you have breaking going at a slightly higher rate than rehealing, you tend to see that um, osteolysis. And those then tend to recover pretty quickly, or they usually require some conservative treatment and they do well very rarely they require any surgery. Um, they recover quickly just through normal rest and uh, gentler or different exercise, do they? Yes, exactly. Once you stop offloading the ACJ, a lot of them recover. Yeah. Um, unless they've lost so much bone that they recover and the joint is then unstable and starts causing them pain. So there are, there are some people that do require injections or even surgery in the end but that seems to be quite rare. So surgical intervention for something like an ACJ pain uh, would be like you know, 8 to 10% at max, right? So cons conservative treatment usually takes care of most of them. Um, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned about certain sports, right? Uh, so I'll just mention something very briefly. 
um, when we were doing, um, when we do surgery for the ACJ, there are lots of smart implant companies that say we need to have implants designed for the shape of the collarbones. And quite a few companies have databases of uh, CTs of collarbones and other bones. And what they do is they design very specific implants to fit those bones, right? And then they say, well, if somebody breaks a bone, at least we know what the average looks like. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the, the AC joint is not always the same shape in a lot of people. So if you are a young man or a woman and you start loading your AC joint early in your life, like doing a lot of cycling, doing a lot of lifting, your shape of the lateral and the clavicle is actually slightly different. So some people may have a very flat end, but those guys that load their joints quite a bit, we find that it becomes a bit more of an, um, an elephant's foot, slightly wider. Why? Because you know nature in your young age is remodeling to make the surface area slightly bigger so that you're able to take all these high impacts. Now, I find that patients that tend to injure their ACJs are the rugby players, are the cyclists, and they've usually been doing it all their lives. The people that injure the ACJs tend to be the ones that have slightly bigger lateral end clavicles anyway. Um, so then the implants that you have designed on a normal population don't work on them because they have a slightly different uh, shape. Um, anyway, that was, that was a, a small interesting comment that we made. Uh, so the, the companies that are making those implants, clearly they're selling them to somebody, otherwise they'd have stopped making them. Does that mean people are fitting the wrong implants to people uh, because that's all they have? Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's subtle differences, right? So, you know, if you, you know, you can have something that is close enough, but when these companies go for something that is specifically designed for the, you know, the, um, so the same, the same company makes collarbone plates, um, and they have a thousand CTs, and when they've made the collarbone plates, I can tell you that collarbone plates fits better than any other plate out there. But when they design the clavicle plates for the ACJ, it doesn't quite fit in um, perfectly. I, there's a few millimeters of gaps here and there. It still does a job beautifully, but if you want to make it perfectly fit, they just had the wrong cohort of CTs. So we encourage them to go and do the measurements on patients that have been cycling all their lives and then have a better implant. Um, so the, the patients don't come to any, um, and you know, like I said, the, the implants do a really good job, even if they don't perfectly fit. You know, we, we like them to fit you know, millimeter perfect, but we know that, does that really make a difference? Probably not. <laughs> Earlier on, you said that you see a lot of patients who have been uh, misdiagnosed in the past. Um, how does that happen? What, what would be your diagnostic process for looking at the AC joint? Okay, so I guess, I guess um, I'd have to think of some of the more recent examples, right? So, um, um, so for example, I've had a, you know, um, a patient come in um, quite recently um, that had an AC joint pain um, and, and his um, x-rays were pretty good. On every view, it looked perfectly lined up and so on. Um, and he had what would be the normal treatment. He will have some rehab. He has three or two or three injections. Every time he had an injection or steroid, it, it took the pain away for a while. It started working less and less. And eventually, the surgeon said, let's shave the joint, right? And he shaved the joint, and it just didn't work, right? It just didn't work. And he was in a lot of pain. Give it more time. Give it another steroid injection. didn't work. And, uh, and then he came and saw me, and, and it was obviously, uh, you know, a, somebody you have to start from the scratch. You know? So, of course, you have to see the imaging, see what's been done, you know, and, and we picked up various problems. One of, the, one of the problems that we picked up was initially that there was a lot of fluid in the area that was resected. So the whole area had a lot of fluid in it, right? So the first question was, is he in pain because he's had post-surgical infection, right? Yeah. Right. So you do all the blood markers and they were normal. Um, and then you have to, you know, you know, you have to slow down a little bit. You have to think every step. You have to eliminate the big stuff. So we took some aspiration out. Lots of fluid came out. We sent it off for microbiology, including extended cultures, including, you know, enrichment cultures. Sometimes 
things like pea acnes and so on only comes out of two weeks of culture. We did that all negative, which was great news. So we know that this wasn't an infection problem. Once we took the fluid out, however, I noticed that he did have a lot of instability, right? So there was a lot of anterior posterior instability. Um, and he had now lost the end of the bone, which is important for providing stability. And he also had, you know, damage to the ligaments. He probably had damage to the ligaments before, but he had now quite a bit of anterior posterior instability. I also got him a CT scan to have a very closer look and I found out that the resection was done in a such a way that the, the contact of the bone was corrected but there was a roof that was left over. So although the, um, the bottom bit had been resected, there was still something that was catching. So now you had a raw surface which was partially resected, edges still catching, plus a lot more anterior posterior instability. Mm -hmm. Then we had to go in and solve all those problems. So, so he required um, his 3D reconstruction. So I got his clavicle 3D printed. It's very easy to do, right? Um, is it necessary? Probably not, because you can imagine the whole thing. But if you have a model in front of you, you can really tell what's left behind because it's not normal anymore. Somebody's partially resected it. So you have to respect what they've left and not left. So. He said, fine, so we get that print. So we know we need to chop the end off in certain ways to sculpt it a bit better. We knew that we needed to tighten up the ligaments around it. We knew that the deltotrapezial fascia was a very important part of stability. We had to correct that as well. And ideally, we thought that would be enough to provide him a good resection and stability. Um, and as a backup plan, I said, if it's not enough, I'll put some artificial ligaments in. So in his case, what we did was just resect the end a little bit and we made sure that we tightened up the ligaments and repaired the deltotrapezial fascia so it gave him good dynamic stability. And he did well. It, it was a relatively easy fix. Obviously, rehab played a, a big part in it afterwards. Uh, I had a similar case, um, and this is quite a common problem, right? So there are there is a whole uh, cohort of patients, especially... Um, uh, young female patients with hyperlaxity that mm -hmm. have a lot of ACJ pain sitting on a desk all day, right? And, and the temptation is to, after conservative treatment, is to shave their joints and to say, that'll solve the problems. But quite often they continue to have pain for a very long time. And I found um, that that those patients that have ACJ resection, that have a very good resection, still continue to have pain because of instability. Um, and you go in and you put, them, put some artificial ligaments around the ACJ to provide stability, and again, the pain goes away. So those are the kind of the subtle things that um, I tend to find actually quite often in my practice when things haven't gone wrong. Um, things haven't got uh, quite right in, um, when they've had something else done before. Yeah, what, do you so use? what do you use as an artificial ligament? Well, it's, so the, the question always is, do you use artificial ligaments or do you use a uh, patient's own ligaments? Um, and uh, certainly if there is any uh, like hyperlaxity or any collagen issues, it's preferable to use artificial ligaments. And I've now moved to using artificial ligaments even in normal patients because why use a tendon that can be used for the ACL some other stage? Uh, there are lots of things you can use. So there is the um, Lars ligament, which is available um, commercially. There's also a ligament called Lockdown, also known as surgery leg. And these are basically, you know, polyester type materials, some kind of plastic material, but it looks like a weave that they tell you that incorporates into um, and, and becomes, an, you know, normal tissue incorporates on it. Are they, are they effectively permanent or do they break down over time? They're permanent, yeah. They're permanent. Yeah, of course. Can I take you back to something earlier? Um, a couple of people have asked for clarification. Did you say earlier on that the clavicle is the most variable bone in the body? Mm, uh, no, um, it's, it's not the most variable bone in the body. I think um, there are two things I said about the clavicle. One was that it's the only bone that connects your arm to the body. 
right? So it is something that takes a lot of forces across the arm, right? Everything else that connects your arm to the body is muscles and tendons. Yep. And ligaments. The collarbone is the only bone that connects it. And all the forces go through the ACJ. Um, the second thing I said was the lateral end of the clavicle, i.e. the end of the clavicle where the ACJ is, that has a lot of variation in it, right? right. Sometimes you have a big wide one, sometimes you have a narrow one, sometimes you have one that slopes like this, sometimes you have a slope like that. And all of those subtle things can make a lot of changes into patient's uh, dynamics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, more questions coming in from the audience. Um, this one's anonymous. Uh, do you find that after surgery that the range of motion of the shoulder is affected? Uh, are we talking about particularly uh, ACJ? Um, yes, 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 sorry, ACJ surgery. Yeah, so the, the idea is that um, your shoulder motion should not be affected. And, and certainly uh, doing surgery, um, if it affects the shoulder motion permanently, is probably not the thing we're aiming for. There are, you know, there are people who develop a, a stiffness response. Um, an adhesive capsulitis type response, etc., in the main shoulder joint. Or um, yes, that can happen, um, and this is something that we try and limit as much as possible by mm -hmm. early rehab, appropriate rehab, etc. But AC joint surgery itself is not something that limits shoulder movement, right? Um, and although some people may get a reaction. Um, to su any surgical trauma uh, to get stiffness. Um, the idea is to limit that as much as possible. And the plan is that when the rehab is over, nobody should have less movement in the shoulder after any ACD surgery. Alistair has asked us to ask you what sort of rehab you recommend for um, patients. Or do you leave that to the physios and osteos and chiros? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's milestone driven um, and, and, um, and a lot of the times the way there are some good physios and osteopaths out there, um, they know what they're doing. But my job as a surgeon is to just tell the surgeon, in any shoulder surgery, is to give an indication to the surgeon, to the physios of the quality of the tissue, the quality of the repair, and any restrictions that I think should be imposed because of that, right? Yeah. Um, so you want to aim to fix your um, shoulder, especially the ACJ, in such a stable way that you can get the patients moving and going, right? But what does that really mean, right? I mean, people say, oh, get it going, right? What does that mean? Well, there are certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. And it's what we call kind of protective rehab, right? So, for example, in a typical ACJ, right, we know that a lot of forces go across the construct of an ACJ repair when you do end range movements, right? So, so, so there's no problems doing things down here, right? It, it doesn't really load the ACJ. So why limit somebody in a sling when they can do something freely here? They can move the elbow as much as possible as well. But in some cases, Movements like this, where it's really end range cross arm adduction, or really hand behind the back, when again to right towards the end of the motion, or any elevation kind of around 120 or so, that is when you start for torsional forces across the ACJ. Mm -hmm. So, typically speaking, I would allow the patient to do full hand, wrist, elbow, scapula setting, neck exercises and most shoulder things at waist level, or I'll ask even loading the cuff, right? Because you don't want that to waste, even loading the deltoid trapezial fascia, or I will limit for the first four weeks or so, cross arm reduction, hand behind the back, or any kind of elevation above 90 degrees, yeah. right? Um, but the physios that work with me regularly know that occasionally, there are certain patients who hit the milestones quite well and who have good stability and no problems at all. After two weeks, they'll go beyond. Sometimes you've got to hold the patients back for six weeks or more as well. Yeah. 
Bob Allen has sent in a question about a specific uh, patient. Apparently he's got uh, a patient who suffers from psoriatic arthritis and also has ACJ pain, which may or may not be related. He's asked what you would recommend as being the best diagnostic tool for ruling it in or out, whether ultrasound scan would be adequate or whether it has to be x-ray. So uh, it's again a very interesting question about ACJs, right? So if you rely on imaging, for ACJs, it will lead you in the wrong direction, okay? There, mm -hmm. Most x-rays will have be showing arthritis in the ACJ and it may be a normal person, right? Um, and in, there are some cases who have ACJ pain uh, who don't have any, any imaging signs at all on an x-ray. So an x-ray, although a very useful tool to rule out the bad and the ugly, like tumors and other stuff, and obvious problems with the ACJ, um, the, in most cases, whether you have arthritis or you don't have arthritis, is not relevant because you can have one or the other, right? Yeah. And it, so the clinical diagnosis is the key in ACJ. An MRI scan uh, could show you a little bit more, but again, when you see an MRI scan in everybody, so if you send an MRI scan that they sometimes the GP send for diagnostic purposes, which I think is wrong, um, MRI scan will often report there is ACG arthritis. Why will it report that? Because they see it on the x-ray, on the MRI scan. If they see it, they have to mention it. Yeah. Well, it's almost never clinically relevant. So I think the, the way I think about ACJs is that 90% of your information comes from a good history and examination. And then the any kind of imaging afterwards is just to confirm your diagnosis or add a little bit more, right? So I tend to always go for an X-ray and an MRI scan if I need something more on an ACJ. Um, I often not don't tend to get an ultrasound scan unless I think the problem is only ACJ of an X-ray when I'm sending them for an image guard injection, for example. Um, or imaging modalities don't help me with the diagnosis as much as uh, other plate, other sites. If the, if the OA, if the arthritis is irrelevant, what is it, that, what tissues, what, um, what is producing the pain in the patient? I think it's instability. I say, so you, the, the, the pain sensors are in the ligaments or the capsule? Yeah, so the, I, I, think the, I think there is inf instability and there is uh, inflammation following that. Um, and, and you have uh, pain fibers in the disc, you have pain fibers in the posterior capsule, uh, and you have, generally speaking, a lot of pain fibers, neurogenic things all around it. Um, um, and, and that is where you get the pain. And we know that people have, a lot of, most people will have arthritis and have no pain in the ACJ. So we know that finding of arthritis by itself is not as relevant. We've got a, a lot of questions about hypermobility in the ACJ and um, wondering what the challenges are for you in dealing with a hypermobile patient. Um, specifically, we've had um, whether it's possible to stabilize it through periarticular sclerosing injections, um, such as prolotherapy, uh, the aim being to passively stabilize the joint. Yes. Um, so the, every joint in the body requires uh, certain things to keep it stable, right? Okay. Um, so you have the bony anatomy, the surface area contact, right? Um, the congruence, congruency of the joint. Um, you have the capsules, the ligaments all around it. Um, but you also have the dynamic stability that comes from the muscles, okay? Now, every joint requires a different proportion of these things. So if you look at a hip joint, for example, a lot of the stability comes from the bony anatomy and the congruency, okay? And there is some added by the ligaments, and there is quite a bit actually added by the muscles around it, right? Uh, but not enough. Most of it comes from the anatomy. If you look at the shoulder joint, some come, it comes from the ligaments, some comes from the bony uh, congruency, but a lot actually comes from the muscles. So 60-70% of the shoulder glenohumeral joint stability comes from the rotator cuff. Yeah. In the ACJ, most of the stability, in my opinion, 
comes from the ligaments and the capsules around it. It's a joint that doesn't move that much. Sec the, the second part of stability, the second most important part of stability of the ACJ, I think, is the bony anatomy, okay? Uh, and then the muscles around it. So if you have somebody who has laxity around the capsule and ligaments, right, um, what you need to do to help that is you can't change the bony anatomy, right? So the only thing that you can do is either make the capsules a bit more stiffer, okay? Yep. Or you can work on the muscles to provide better control, not better strength, but better control of the ACJ, right? So your deltoid mm -hmm. and your trapezius. So primarily the idea would be initially to decrease the pain so that you can rehab, so you can do any kind of injection in my practice. Um, and uh, do rehab specifically to provide some dynamic stability around the shoulder. You can do a lot of other injections to help as well. So yes, you know, um, potential of in injections that can stiffen up the capsule and so on can help, right? It, there is absolutely no harm in trying for sure, especially, um, you know, as the next steps when rehab has failed to provide muscle control um, is to consider surgical options, right? So uh, if you have a hypomobile patient, I will do everything possible to avoid surgical intervention. The reason is that surgery done needs to be done for a good reason. If there is, a, if there is reason not to do surgery, then you should do it. And secondly, surgery needs to be predictable, right? Um, and I find that if patients haven't engaged with a good uh, rehab plan, then, and they're relying on surgery, there's more likely to fail as well. So I really tend to push them again with conservative treatment, get the rehab done. And in those patients that have engaged and have still failed the rehab, they tend to do okay with surgery. Um, and if I do surgery on them, you can imagine that, you know, we're not really going to rely on their own ligaments to provide stability. Um, so there will be artificial things, ligaments that you use to provide anterior posterior instability as well as cranial cord instability. But it's big surgery and it's often not necessary. And Josephine's asked an interesting question. We talk a lot about the ACJ, but if that's unstable, what's going on at the other end? Do you ever have to deal with um, the sternal end of the, of the bone? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, no, so I so I tend to see so the hypermobile patients tend to have more problems, obvious problems with the SCJ rather than the ACJ, symptomatic anyway. Um, that that is a harder problem huh? because um, you don't have that thick muscle envelope around that you have on this side of the deltoid and trapezius. So you have some muscle around, but you don't have a lot around here. Um, so yes, we tend to see them. The, uh, the algorithms are pretty much the same. They tend to have injections to it. They tend to have rehab on it. And luckily, most of them seem to be okay. Uh, but I do a fair share of surgery there as well. So I probably do about five or six of them a year. That's probably more than most people. Um, it's, it's a tiger country, as we call it, right? So there are major blood vessels as are uh, limb and life threatening if you nick them. So you have to be very, very careful. Um, and, and if I do surgery on them, it's, a, it's again, the combination of, um, to provide stability, I tend to do two things. One is artificial ligaments and so on with anchors. But I also tend to provide some additional dynamic stability by using a, a sleeve of your sternocleidomastoid tendon rolling it up and putting it through the clavicles. It's very fancy surgery. Um, and, and, uh, and the less I have to do of it, the more grateful that I am. Because, uh, <laughs> because you know, I, I tend to get sent those surgeries when you know, all else fails and I still try to try and avoid them, yeah. I've got a lengthy question here from Yogan. I'm gonna have to read it. Um, uh, Yogan says he's had a cycling accident and ruptured his AC ligament and has been given a false ligament. The end of the clavicle was removed, and supposedly uh, this allows it to reset easier. Uh, this has undergone some lysis. I had a post-op frozen shoulder and lots of pain for a long time, severe for most of the first 12 months. He still has shoulder pain three years later. 
An arthrogram shows that he has a large slap tear and tear to the biceps tendon where the pain increases if loaded. Would that explain the pain? There was some talk of stapling the slap tear and anchoring the biceps tendon. Are these procedures generally successful? Fantastic. So, um, so let's let's go with the first one first, right? So, um, so unfortunately, a lot of the surgical techniques published by um, a lot of the um, people out there talk about chopping the end of the clavicle out because they're worried about arthritis. Um, most people that do ACJ surgery seriously don't chop the end of the clavicle off anymore. Okay. In fact, it's been shown as far as 20 years back by a guy called Muzaka that showed that even in cadavers, if you take the lateral end of the clavicle out, you, pro you increase a lot of anterior posterior instability. So you're going in to stabilize an AC joint um, and you put some artificial ligaments in which help then you forget about repairing the muscles and you chop off the lateral end of the clavicle, which is counterintuitive, right? It doesn't make sense. No. Uh, often when people do that, um, you tend to get that lysis and so on, but you also tend to uh, hold patients back from rehab because you provided them ligaments, but then you're afraid that your repair isn't strong enough. So you kind of hold them back and don't rehab them aggressively enough, uh, proactively enough and they tend to stiffen up their shoulder. Um, that is unfortunate, happens enough. So my first advice is not to chop the end of the clavicle off. Address all the, um, if you're doing surgery on ACJ, keep the clavicle end, repair the ligaments if you need to, repair the muscles if you should do, if they're torn, and then rehab them quickly and make sure the glenamal joint doesn't get stiff. Now there are other reasons as well. So, 10 to 20% of ACJ injuries tend to have a missed glenohumeral joint injury as well. So slap tears tend to happen in 10 to 15, 10 to 20% of the patients who have ACJ injuries. They may be from previous injuries, but we think a significant proportion of patients injure their biceps anchor, either slap or some kind of labral injury or some kind of tendon injury or the cuff mm -hmm. in addition to the ACJ. So it is important when you have somebody who has an ACJ injury to make sure they haven't got uh, something else. And that usually involves a, a clinical examination. So, but unfortunately, in that case, they may have been missed. Now, if you have a glenohumeral joint injury in addition to the ACJ, then immobilization with the secondary injury is more likely to give you a stiff shoulder. Because why do you get stiffness? is a body's reaction to trauma. So you have more trauma inside the glenohumeral joint, plus you're immobilized, you will throw up a lot of scar tissue. The pain is probably mostly to do with stiffness, right? This, the stiff adhesive post-traumatic capsulitis is more painful than actually a slap tear. But there will be patients who have an unstable uh, biceps that get pain as well. So I would say that moving on from where he is right now, he does need a good look at. We need to make sure the shoulder isn't stiff. The shoulder is stiff, you need to get rid of the stiffness. And yes, after that, if the slap is still painful, then surgery is successful. Um, but more often than not, it is unlikely that he's had, if he's had a stiff, painful shoulder with that injury, that he will do well with a slap repair. What he actually needs is the labrum to be repaired independently where the biceps needs to be snipped, unfortunately, and needs to be fixed in the up here, i.e. tenodesis. Um, so that's what you would do well. And by all means, Stephen, um, uh, please give him my personal number and my email, and I can, I can talk him through it. Okay, okay, that's very kind. Ali, I'm very conscious that you have a patient at 2 o'clock, and many of our audience have a patient at 2 o'clock, and it's now um, one minute to... So sadly, I've got lots of other questions which I could have put to you, but we've come to the end of our scheduled time. Uh, it's fascinating stuff, and I think it's the first time we've addressed the AC joint specifically on this show, so I'm very grateful to you. Thank you for coming in.